going to wear that? Why don't you just walk in there naked? Don't be silly. I'd only be able to hide one gun if I were naked. Speaking of which, make sure you don't go waving them around in there. Your guns, that is. The Black Tuck Secret Service is usually carrying weapon sensors. If you get too close, you're dead. When you hear the sensor's proximity ping, bolt the other way. Don't worry about me. I can party with the best of them. Of all the Resident Evil clones that popped up in the late 90s and early 2000s, Fear FX stands out as one of the more unique series to arise. It had a heavy focus on puzzles, gun combat, instant deaths. It pulled heavily from Chinese mythology, splashes of cyberpunk, John Woo and heist films, and plenty of fan service. It made use of looping videos as backgrounds compared to static pre-renders, and was a bit ahead of the curve with its cell shaded approach to its graphics. While not a huge seller, it has its share of a devoted audience, yours truly included. After seeing the upcoming remake of the first title, which doesn't look overly promising, it got me thinking about the series and taking a look back on it. While it has its share of frustrations, there's plenty of fun and memorable moments and unique flavor that have helped the Fear Effect series stand out. How you find this funny then? How's this for a punchline? The first two Fear Effect titles were developed by Kronos Digital Entertainment and released in early 2000 and 2001 respectively. Prior to Fear Effect, they made a few fighting game titles, one of those being Dark Rift for the N64. This is notable for being the first N64 title to hit 60 FPS. Another title was Meat Puppet, an isometric action title. This approach is something the series would use in the future, although not by this studio. Fear Effect would be their crack at the Resident Evil formula, as this time frame was full of Resident Evil clones. What helped Fear Effect stand out was the strong Chinese influence. Stanley Liu, the founder of the studio, was born and raised in Hong Kong and moved to the States when he was 16. His parents were stout Buddhists, but he went to a Catholic school. This clash between the two cultures helped him come up with a story of Westerners trapped in the Chinese hell, and that was the birth of the idea of Fear Effect. To note the name Fear Effect, it was initially called Fear Factor. It wasn't changed because of the reality TV show with the same name, which came out a year later. It was because the band Fear Factory thought they were infringing on their name. With that, let's look into the presentation and gameplay of the first two Fear Effect titles. These two titles make use of the fixed camera approach, a unique take on the backgrounds. Instead of a 3D rendered world, which would be tough to pull off of the hardware limitations, and feeling that pre-rendered backgrounds were too static, Fear Effect makes use of looping video backgrounds. This was them using their motion FX engine. As a result, despite short play times, both titles make use of four discs for the PlayStation. This is something you get from RPG at the time with 50 plus hours of playtime. I'm guessing that the game gives less real estate to the gameplay on screen to help save on the disc space as well. As a result, the backgrounds have more life to them and help fear effects stand out. Although you can notice when the video loop occurs, but it's not immersion breaker or anything. Fear Effect was a bit ahead of the curve in regards to having a cell shaded approach to its character design. This was done to help characters stand out from the looping backgrounds. To note, I am emulating these titles for this video, and I did upscale it a bit, but the backgrounds remain the same. This approach to its presentation has helped the Fear Effect series stand out, but how about the gameplay? Well, Fear Effect makes use of tank controls, as most fixed camera titles do. You can sneak behind enemies for an instant kill and can roll for dodging. Combat is a bit awkward, but in a different way than most fixed camera titles. This is due to Fear Effect's emphasis on ranged combat. Most enemies will have a ranged attack, like bots with lasers or guards with guns. This is something most fixed camera titles avoid, instead having enemies with melee attacks. Here, if enemies aren't on screen, it's like they don't exist until you cross that camera cut, even though in reality they're just a few feet away from you, looking your direction, which you could take advantage of once you get used to it, but it is a bit of an immersion breaker. Aiming is auto, and if you're aiming in the general direction, you'll most likely be fine. Some weapons can be dual wield, so you could shoot two enemies at the same time or one with two guns. It mostly works okay, all things considered, although in the first fear effect, the shotgun could be super inconsistent. It was seemingly random with its damage. A shot point blank barely did anything, while a shot further down could take a couple guards down with one shot. Granting when you're switching between screens, it's not like you have zero knowledge of what to expect. You could hear your enemies. There'll be an audio cue with your heartbeat. This is the fear effect system. When you take damage, your heart rate increases and further damage leads to death. To recover your health or reduce your heart rate, you complete certain stretches or solve a puzzle. There are no health kits. While Fear Effect takes many cues from survival horror titles, it does have its differences with a more action-focused approach. There is no limited inventory here, no limited saves, and little backtracking, at least in the first title. There's plenty of ammo. It's not a huge concern of trying to use stealth kill enemies versus gunning them down. The inventory here is in real time. It keeps the pace of the game up, but can create some frustrations at points, especially when scrolling through guns. Reloading is also a bit of an awkward ordeal to bring up and then reload. It takes a bit to get used to. I found myself several times early on on switching guns when I just wanted to reload. We'll also get items to help unlock roadblocks, such as keys. I am amused by the attitude our characters can give when we pick the wrong item for a roadblock. No. 
This becomes an annoying issue in Fear Effect 2, where you'll be giving a whole stack of these kind of items. Various roadblocks, I wouldn't be sure which one to use, and I'd cycle through the various items to see if I had the right one. Nope. One of the noble aspects of Fear Effect are the quality and the amount of puzzles involved. There are a number of instant death maze or stealth puzzles, especially in the first title, which do lead to a lot of great, unique game overs. Hey. <laughs> 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 Although they can be quite frustrating to get through with their trial and error nature. One of the main problems playing this back in the day were the long load times after dying. Now these games are quite reasonable with its save point placement, so it's not a long trek back, but the loading times were a real momentum killer. Of course, this is now trivial with emulation where you could speed it up or make use of save states, but it is something to note. Some of these can really get the heart racing, and not just our characters' heart rates. Some can be quite hectic and complex to get through, one where you have to watch the loop a number of times to get the pattern right. There are also a large number of logic-based puzzles in Fear Effect. And it does have some of the better puzzles I've come across in the title. They're quick enough to solve that doesn't bring the game to a halt, but they're mostly not just quick affairs either. When it comes to puzzles, I usually find there's about three reactions that you come up with for the player. The first one being that they're fairly easy, so you don't think much of it. These can be more as palate cleansers. I find the Resident Evil series are a good example of these type of puzzles. Then there are the ones where you hit your head against the wall and might have to look up for hints or get something to get the brain going. In some cases, this can lead to the player thinking, how the fuck was I supposed to figure that one out? And then there's the reaction where after fumbling around for a time, you go, oh, I get it now. This is where most puzzles fall under in regards to Fear Effect. There were a couple of cases of how was I supposed to figure this out. Considering how many puzzles the games have, especially the second title, it's a success in my book. And then there are the horror elements of Fear Effect. There are stretches where horror is more in the background emerges later, but with that, let's look more into the games themselves, starting with the first Fear Effect. Fear Effect takes place over four acts. A heist gone wrong. Nothing is straightforward and our crew have to make their way out of these situations with their back against the wall. Our motley crew here consists of three characters that we'll jump back and forth playing as. The first being our protagonist, the ringleader of the three, Hana, or Hannah. The game jumps back and forth between how it's pronounced, depending on which character says it. My name <laughs> is Hana! Of French and Chinese descent, her parents were killed at a young age and she was raised in a brothel. She knows when to use her womanly charms to help out in situations. You can see elements of Lara Croft in her, like the twin pistols and some of her attitude. This was in the heyday of Tomb Raider and under the Eidos umbrella. Developers had to be careful as Lara was Eidos' golden girl, and Eidos didn't want Hana competing against her. This was another one of the reasons they went with the cell shaded approach, but also making Hana and her crew anti-heroes. Second is Glass, an ex-military American who's a bit no-nonsense in his approach in a tough act. Anna, stay here with Deke and cover our best. I'm coming with you. Not yet. Just in case Madame Chen recognizes you. And that is a possibility, right? Thirdly is Deke, our wise-cracking Aussie who loves violence. That wasn't very neighborly of you there, mate. The makeup of the heist gang is key to get these type of stories to work, and these three work very well off one another. There's plenty of meanwhile back at the ranch moments where we'll reach a crescendo with one character to switch to another. It's a set that works super well. It's always tricky to pull off games where you're not just playing as one character, but they do so very well here. Act 1 takes place on the Hong Kong rooftops. There's a much larger world at play here, but the scope of fear effect is kept quite small. It doesn't go huge into the lore of the world, but instead focuses on our characters. It's set in the future and you can see the cyberpunk influence, but it's mostly just a backdrop for what's going on here. Wee Ming Lam, the daughter of the most powerful triad leader in Hong Kong, has gone missing. The plan is for Han and her crew to find her and use her for random for a nice chunk of cash. It's a simple setup and we're introduced to two of our crew here. Not what you call good people, but they're likable. Of course, the simple setup goes in some interesting directions in a fairly short time frame as well. Our contact Jin is nowhere to be found, so we go investigate. One of the game's numerous instant death mazes takes place early on here. You have to be pretty quick and react fast to get through them once you have the pattern. Luckily, a save point isn't that far away. There's a great scene of Jin strapped with a bomb and he and Hana negotiate over rates. Which is worth 15% of 90 million and you're in no position to negotiate. 90 mil? That's your asking price to, to guarantee her safe return? No guarantees. You know me better than that, Jin. Huh. 
Looks like I'll need to cut two of three wires between each delay without interrupting the circuit. And if you cut the wrong wires? Wrong wires or wrong order and boom. Uh, or I could just say screw the money and leave you here. I'll cut my fee. Uh, 12%. 10. 10%. 10 percent, huh? Hana, please. You owe me. Not after this, I don't. Jin is quickly killed off afterwards. Nothing goes to the plan, so we take over Glass for a time and hop back and forth between him and Hana. We'll also cross paths with Wheeling's father, Mr. Lamb, as things get more complex by the minute. Our business here is done. You may shoot. With pleasure! There's some looping video boss fights throughout these titles. What do I mean by that? Well, they'll loop over as we slowly whittle them down. For Act 2, now with Mr. Lamb on her ass, we'll have to find Wee Ming to get some leverage of survival. Now our good pal Deke enters the fold. Excuse me, Mr. Decourt. This package arrived for you. Cheers. We're off to Shanji downriver to go to Madame Chen's, someone that Hana has a past with. Going down the river, we come across a fishing village where we see Wee Ming. This stretches more survival horror in its nature with the enemies that we deal with. They are crazed villagers that act like zombies, so it's easier to navigate around them if you want. <laughs> However, the game is also generous with ammo should you wish to gun them down. Plenty of meanwhile back at the ranch moments here as we switch off between the three characters as they're separated. We get more insight into the happenings here as things get more odd by the minutes. Yesterday, a boy was fishing by himself and fell on the rocks. His leg was cut and he would have bled to death had he had not been found by a young woman. A stranger. We mean? She was covered in his blood when she brought him back to the village. We were, of course, grateful and gathered to meet her. That is when the madness began. And then we reach the highlight and the funniest moment in the game with a great setup and payoff. Since they were in a rush, Hana did get changed on the boat after having a shower, so she's just wearing a towel here at first. She ends up getting caught by a guard and held up. So what can we do in this situation? Well, you can pick the towel in your inventory. Hello, Hannah, dear. Not too long, Deke. I've killed men for much less. Yeah, right. Sorry. So, what you got, eh? Military supply train. Probably loaded with weapons. Well, I'd better have a closer look then. At the train, that is. The scene has stuck with me over the years, not just for the fan service, but taking a simple joke and executing it wonderfully, something that many games struggle to do. There is a bit of an annoying puzzle with getting this ladder down, where it wasn't made clear at first I could move these switches over. But one of my favorite puzzles in the game is this train puzzle, taking this message and deciphering the code from it. Very much one of those, oh, I get it puzzles. We take Wee Ming to go see Mam Chen as she seeks answers from her. In exchange, she'll help us get our money. Act 3 takes place at Madame Chen's, a restaurant and a brothel. There is a personal connection here with Hana as she was raised by Madame Chen. You, you think there's an answer inside that building? Inside those walls, there's only pain and despair. Of course, nothing goes right here. There's a number of instant death mazes and stealth sections, longer puzzles, combat stretches, and constant switches back and forth amongst their characters. As far as the instant death maze sections, the one on the roof is one of the better ones. It's less about fast reaction time and more about planning your route. It's nice to have a stretch where Hana can move around conspicuously in certain areas without having to gun down everyone. Quick moves there, Sheila. <gasps> Hannah? Jeez, nice shoes. Not now, Deke. I'm not a huge fan of puzzles where you find something in one room and just replicate it in another, but there's something amusing about this dance on TV and applying it to this puppet. Hello. Things don't go well for Glass here. Think you can extort me, Mr. Glass? Come between me and my daughter? Separate me from my flesh? Looks like I'll need a bit of a hand with things going forward. Things really start to go off the rails here with this place down infested with demon hookers and Deke biting the dust. This again turns more survival horror with the enemy approach, although killing these demons will drop generous amounts of ammo. <laughs> And we 
to get more insight into about Wee Ming, her father, and Yim Lao Long, the king of hell. Of course, we need to deal with Madame Chen. I always <laughs> thought you were bitch from hell. Then, as you die, take some small comfort in knowing that you were right. <laughs> Luckily, this fight is fairly easy. And with that, the fourth and final act takes us to hell. I love this version and interpretation of hell. This pulls from Chinese mythology. This helps it stand out compared to what I'm used to seeing with hell in games or other forms of media. Burning the paper for ammo and guns is a nice touch as well. And Han and Glass walking into hell without blinking an eye? What great characters they are. In the grand scheme of things, the trio of Hana, Glass, and Deke are overlooked with how enjoyable and well written they are. There is more backtracking here compared to previous sections, which just feel like a bit of padding, but the atmosphere more than makes up for it. There's far less cutting back between Glass and Hana, instead we get fairly long stretches with both of them. Glass's section can be a bit frustrating since he only has one arm, removing the ability to dual wield guns. His fight against Demon Deke can be fairly frustrating as well. For the ending stretch, there are a few endings, but to get the best one where everyone lives, including Deke, you have to beat the game on hard. Well, not the entire game. You could just change the game to hard and then beat the last boss. Remember Jim from a few discs back? Well, it turns out he's the king of hell. I would prefer if you address me by my true name. <laughs> Jim Lao Wong. Yes, Hama. I am the king of hell. Yeah, the story in Fear Effect goes in some pretty interesting directions in a short stretch of time. You know those JRPGs that start with your character helping your uncle catch fish and end with you fighting some god over the stretch of 40 plus hours? Fear Effect, we go from trying to kidnap the daughter of a tribe leader to take on the king of hell in about half a dozen hours. Yet even with that short time frame, it doesn't feel out of place, rushed, or jarring. So while it does have its frustrations, Fear Effect is a great memorable title that showed a lot of promise as a series. Shall we go, darling? Yes, most certainly, darling. Ta-ta. Fear Effect 2 would come out a year later in early 2001. The team took the feedback, the good and the bad, from Fear Effect and made some tweaks. The instant death mazes and puzzles were cut back on. There is less combat and more puzzles. Fear 2 is a fair amount longer as well, a common complaint about the first title being that it was too short. However, this results in the pacing of Fear Effect 2 not being as tight, with some further padding and backtracking. While I still prefer the original overall, this one is an excellent follow-up. Fear Effect 2 is a prequel, and how the three amigos, Hana, Deke, and Glass, end up working together. The name is Hannah, not Love or Doll. No need to piss on me. The name's Jacob. Me mates call me Deke. Look, Dick. Deke. There's also the addition of Rain to the fold, whom Hana works with and at times will play as. I remember back in the day seeing ads for this game. They really played up the sex appeal factor here with the relationship between Rain and Hana. In the game itself, it's not really there. It's more under the surface that Hana has feelings for Rain. There's pretty much just one explicit scene between them, and that's used to distract guards. Yo, check this out. Um, the camera? Sorry boys, this is private. Kick them out. No way, maybe the dress will fall off. Interesting tactic, Hannah. What tactic? Shall we continue? Stanley Leo mentioned he didn't focus on this aspect of the relationship but didn't mind the ads as it got to people's attention. The main reason for including Rain here was to create a love triangle for a future title that wouldn't see the light of day, but more on that later. Hana, Glass, and Deke all get different voice actors this time around. Glass more or less sounds the same. I didn't really care for Deke's new voice. The name's Jacob. Me mates call me Deke. This little spitfire's Hana. And Hana's voice? She's voiced by veteran Wendy Lee, who's done a ton of voice work, and this is one of her first game roles. Looking at behind the voice actor, people best know her for the voice of Faye Valentine from Cowboy Bebop. Maybe it's because I watched a show not that long ago, but at times it felt less that I was playing Hana and more of playing Faye Valentine. Although I did get over as time goes on. Fear Effect 2 takes a lighter tone than the first, and goes in some very interesting directions just like the first. Set prior to the events of Fear Effect, Fear Effect 2 deals with ends, a disease that has wiped out a decent chunk of the world. One doctor has claimed to have 
have isolated the gene. It was the retrohelix that causes it. Uh, I think he's full of cow dew, but what do I know? Jin gives Hana and Rain a job to go steal some DNA samples, and a very long intro laying out how this heist will go down. The beginning stretch introduces us to bot enemies and some new firearms. Are your aqueducts falling apart? When was the last time your subterranean tunnel system passed a safety inspection? Well, your days of bribing public officials are over, thanks to The Fixer. Fear Effect 2 offers a much larger variety on the weapons front, which can be a bit annoying to cycle through, but more on the inventory later. But hey, at least the shotgun here is at least consistent this time around. The game is more generous with some of these death mazes. Instead of one mistake resulting in death, it just results in damage. This stretch is mostly enjoyable, hopping back and forth between Rain and Hana, solving puzzles. But some of the pacing issues of Fear Effect 2 pop up here. There's a few stretches of backtracking all the way back to the beginning to pick up a dropped item. There's a lot of intrigue as well of these guys running away from us, and someone watching us. Bad. He was sick. He went <coughs> crazy. Fix a star attack. He <coughs> can't stop him. Rain gets captured at one point, so we'll free her as Hana, and we'll find Rain attached to this machine. What the absolute fuck is going on here? The game doesn't really get into it beyond this little dialogue exchange between the two. You had your fun on that pony ride back there. It was a cheap thrill. When asked about it, Stanley Liu said the story behind that scene is whatever you want it to be. Well, some things are best left unexplained. Act 2 takes place at and around the party that we're infiltrating to get access to these DNA samples we're after. Rain works from the rooftops as she clears out some guards. If you really wanted to disorient the player like the game does here, put a maze in the game using fixed cameras. There were a few instances throughout Fear Effect 2 when I found myself going in circles, realizing I had missed a different screen later on. This is a common problem with fixed camera titles. I didn't have any of that with the first Fear Effect, but there are a few cases of it happening here. With Hana, we get to explore the party, staying off guards range as they'll detect anything we're carrying. There are some enjoyable and funny moments here. Hey beautiful, haven't I seen you somewhere before? Yes, that's why I never go there anymore. Ouch, can I at least buy you a drink? It's an open bar, you moron. The name's Tom, Big Tom. I'm your man. I can get you anything you need. I need you to crawl back to your geeky little friend there and leave me alone. Love your dress. It looked great crumpled up at the end of my bed. No? Well, I'll be right here. The problem is you mostly just have to wander around and trigger a few conversations to progress. It's not clear where you need to do so beyond just randomly walking around. We make our way into the building to steal the DNA strands. This is where some Fear Effect 2's major issues arise that weren't so prominent the first. We now have a ton of items in our inventory. At some points I would just cycle through them. Do I use this one here? How about this one? Nope. There's a number of well-constructed puzzles here, there's also some that just go on a bit too long. Like the shape matching one. Good puzzle, but it just keeps throwing more shapes at us and just goes on and on. There's a DNA matching puzzle that takes a long time. And I can see this being a nightmare for people who are colorblind, where green and yellow can be hard to see the difference between. Now while enjoyable, I don't find the dynamic or banter between Rain and Hana as enjoyable as the banter between Hana, Deke, and Glass. But they'll be entering the fold shortly. Fear Effect 2 also has an odd order in how it switches between discs. The first game is 1 through 4, and then 2 briefly for the ending. Here it's 1, 2, 1, 4, 3, 4, 2, 3. Act 3 takes us to the abandoned city of Xi'an, where Deke and Glass are brought into the fold. They've been told to drop off their packages here. At first, they're all at each other's throats before they end up working together. Unprofessional, Hannah. You draw on me, you better be ready to pay the consequences. Oh, but I'm always ready. <laughs> now do you mind getting off me? Glasser is more as the comic relief here compared to Deke in the original. When the Chinese government- Okay, look, I'll find your donkey for you. Anything, just shut up. This section is more survival horror with zombies and demon creatures. It's more combat heavy and it's more back to the original now that we're switching between Deke, Glass, and Hana. And like the first fear effect, this is where things really start to get out there in regards to Chinese history and mythology. Stop. Just exactly what in hell is going on here, Hannah? And who's that freak in the costume? I think he's wearing the royal robe of the emperor. An emperor? Of China? Not an emperor. He's the first emperor of China. Chung Shi Huangdi. 
Act 4 ramps up with the Chinese mythology in dealing with the eight immortals. Glass and Hana have to go through a number of trials to progress. There are some issues here with these challenges going on too long, like the section where Glass playing the strategy minigame. Of all the puzzles in the series, this colored gem puzzle is probably my favorite. It took a few tries, but felt damn good when I realized I got the right solution. The section on the island the elements is a frustrating ordeal, don't let that peaceful music fool you. There's some instant death mazes, trying to figure out what of your numerous items to use where, and some demons to deal with. What makes this part even more annoying is the lack of health replenishment. The game has been fairly generous with restoring our health when we complete a section or puzzle, but it goes a long stretch here where we get none of that. Glass's portion is combat heavy as we go through a flashback from his earlier days. What makes this section annoying is that the enemies here can roll as well, making aiming and hitting them a bit of a frustrating experience. There's also this one insta-death maze where it took me a bit to realize, oh wait, those aren't barriers, I could step on those to be safe. One of those issues that arise with the fixed camera perspective. So at this point we've collected tons of items that's in our inventory and we can finally dispose of them here. And it's not in that cool way. Instead it's nice that cycling through items doesn't take as long anymore. One of those great gaming tropes in Dunright is carrying an item for a long period of time in that moment when you can finally use it. Ever play Planescape Torment? There's one item, a bronze sphere, that you have for most of the game. During the end stretch you could use it and the revelation is one of the best moments in the game full of them. That's not the case here. During this end stretch with the Eight Immortals, the story gets way out there in regards to the Yen's disease, the Eight Immortals, Immortality, the One, Entity, Zerain, and her twin sister Mist. There's a lot to it, and to be frank, there's a lot of it that I don't really know what's going on. But hey, I was expecting this after the first title and they delivered here. I do like the contrast in how serious Hana takes these conversations with the Immortals to Glass's let's get this over with attitude. I am Cheng Li Chuan, one of the Eight Immortals who guard the threshold. Then that must be the legendary Choi Mogim. Must I fight you? No, Hannah. Choi Mogim is reserved for fighting evil. Xiao Chu was right. You are one of kindness and compassion, despite your upbringing. You may pass. Should I land on your resting spot, you'll have to move six paces back. Questions? What, no swimming through acid or crawling over hot lava? If that is your wish. Look, I'm rolling! It also helps explain why they didn't blink an eye in the first game when they descend into hell what with after they've gone through here. In this end stretch we have to decide, which one of the twins is rain and which one is mist? Well if you paid attention throughout the game, the choice should be made fairly clear. Not just by the item she's holding on to, but how she's holding on to it. How did you know? My reign's left-handed. With that, the end's cure is found and distributed. We have the setup for the job that takes place in Fear Effect, an explanation of why Rain wasn't present. Great! What do we have to do? We are not doing anything. This time, you are definitely staying home. But- No buts. It's a quick and dirty retrieval. No computer genius needed. Thinking about bringing the boys. As I mentioned earlier, it's not as good as a game as the first. While it's a less frustrating experience in most instances, the pacing isn't as tight, I prefer the darker tone of the original, and I prefer the dynamic of the three in the first. But it's not a huge quality drop. If you said you preferred this fear effect, I have no issues with that. They're both excellent titles in line with one another. It's a simple job, Glass. Walk in, give a disc, pick up the girl, daddy gives us some nice pocket change. What could go wrong? Oh, I mean, need the cash. Got some real expensive girlfriends to take care of. Just make sure you cover all the angles, eh? So what would happen with the series afterwards? The next release in the Fear Effect series wouldn't occur until 2018, but that wasn't the initial plan. The third title, Fear Effect Inferno, was set to release in 2003 for the PlayStation 2, but was cancelled. The reason? The game did not meet the quality standards set by IDOS. During this time frame, IDOS set a more stringent quality assurance program. Despite IDOS being the publisher, developer Kronos still had full ownership of the IP. They shopped the game around to other publishers, but no takers. The company was disbanded in 2002 as a result. IDOS would then obtain the IP. From what I've researched, it seems the game was fairly far along in development. 
and there's a fair amount of information of how the game would turn out story-wise. So a few years after the first game, Hana tries to purchase her contract back from the Triads, but the Triad leader refuses. The gang of four would set out to try to take down the Triad leader. Information on Inferno indicates that there had been more of a psychological horror focus on the title, with Hana ending up in an asylum, where she would deal with hallucinations and a trip to hell. There would be a love triangle between Hana, Glass, and Rain. The game was going to have more emphasis on action and less on puzzles. With their fighting game pass, Fear Effect Inferno was going to pull more from that world. There were going to be punch and kick combos and perform air juggles. Grappling was going to be added in. Gunplay was going to be more stylish. Previews indicated that they took some influence from Devil May Cry. A health meter would be added in addition to the fear meter. While there was footage shown to the public, these were just cutscenes. No gameplay videos were shown to the public. So why was this cancelled? Why did it not meet IDOS quality standards? Who knows? Perhaps they weren't happy with how long it was taking for the game to be made. The combat tweaks would have created a much larger scope for the title. Perhaps it wasn't coming together the way they envisioned it. Perhaps the series didn't have the sales numbers they were hoping for. This was also getting to the tail end of fixed camera titles from large studios. While they did good numbers when released on the PC over a decade later, Resident Evil Remake and Resident Evil Zero didn't do huge sales for the GameCube. I would love to see how this game looked in action beyond just screenshots, but unless someone decides to leak a build the game, I guess we'll never know. And the series would lie dormant for years, and would come under new ownership when Square Enix bought IDOS. Deke, don't sleep in my bed, and don't steal my girl. No worries. No promises. For as negative as the reviews are for Fear Effect Sedna, and this being my first time playing it, I was expecting something much worse than what I played. Is it a great game? By no means. A good one? Not overly, but I've played worse. With a Metacritic score around 40 of 100, it sure doesn't feel like one. Maybe a mid to high 60s would feel better. Now I do have a few things to consider here. I did pay only a dollar for this game. After seeing so many reboots or sequels of long dormant IPs over the last decade, in which developers have little to no understanding or respect of the source material, that's not the case here. The story isn't what I call engaging, the writing does lack that bite of the original titles, the horror is missing. You can tell the team working on Sudden at least had some respect and understanding of the Fear Effect series. Plus, Plus, they were working with what they had, which wasn't much. Compared to how some other Kickstarter titles turned out with much larger budgets than here, I've seen much worse. In 2014, Square Enix launched the Square Enix Collective. A cross between Kickstarter and Steam Greenlight, this collective allows developers to pitch ideas that would be presented and with enough interest, Square Enix would help them get their game published. Since then, 14 titles have been published, one recent notable title being Power Wash Simulator. French developer Sushi had one of their titles published by the collective, Pitch for a Fear Effect title. In early 2015, Square Enix asked developers to pitch ideas for a number of IPs which include Fear Effect, and accepted their pitch. So even though they had Square Enix as a publisher, with the way the collective works, Sushi was responsible for the development and had to use their own funds. Square would provide some technical support, some QA, marketing, and take a smaller cut compared to if they funded it. They did a Kickstarter started with 100k euro as a goal, which they reached with 107k overall. So that's not a ton to work with resource wise. I mean, would it have killed Square Enix to throw some money their way? They're not exactly setting up some of these titles for success on that front by farming their IPs off without much kind of monetary support. But hey, I'm sure we're all well aware of just how bizarre Square Enix has been in regards to how they handle their Western IPs. Which leads to the question, with the Embracer group inquiring a whole batch of Western IPs from Square Enix in May of 2022, was the Fear Effect IP part of this acquisition? Doing a bit of digging, I found a tweet from Square Enix's senior mastering manager and license coordinator. They said that Square where Enix still owns the Fear Effect IP. So with all that out of the way, let's get to the game itself. Hello? Excuse me. I was waiting for someone and... Ah, there she is. Instead of a fixed camera approach, Sedna uses an isometric viewpoint and retains the cell shaded look. And you know what? Going with an isometric approach isn't a bad choice. Sure, I would have loved a fixed camera, but you know how large studios feel about that approach these days. But it's the execution of this approach that's lacking here. Feels like the developers weren't sure what direction to take it in. Combat is extremely awkward as a result. And like the first two Fear Effect titles, there are points in Sedna where we're controlling up to five characters at once at various points. So when I think isometric any titles with multiple characters, I think of something like turn-based combat, like Shadowrun Returns. It's a title the team mentioned that they were inspired by, but at some point plans must have changed. There's no use of turn-based combat here. Which is too bad, as that was a successful Kickstarter game that showed that kind of style could work on a smaller budget. You can pause the combat to set future commands, but at times it wouldn't really work the way I wanted it to. Another approach they could have taken would be more like the prior titles and keep playing as just one character at a time. Split the party. In that case, they could have gone with a combat system more along the lines of something like, say, Transistor. As well, there's very little use of hopping back and forth between characters, 
something that was done so well in the prior titles. This does impact the momentum and pacing that the prior titles had, building out that suspense of returning to that other character. That's not present here, for the most part. There are some good ideas with the combat, the concept of sinking special attacks amongst your group for more damage. Lower health leads to higher damage output, but the execution just isn't there, and it leads to a choppy experience that simply doesn't work. On the puzzle front, Sudden does a pretty good job here. There are a number of puzzles that you're going to toy around with for a bit until the revelation hits you of what you need to do. However, there are several puzzles where I had zero clue of what I was supposed to be doing at first, which would lead to instant deaths. And there are some decent cutscenes here for that. Although I don't understand why they give me the choice to either load or quit upon death. Just load things back up and I'll quit if I want afterwards, damn it. There were opportunities to do a few navigation puzzles of controlling various characters to progress forward. That wasn't used here in what feels like a missed opportunity. With that, what about the story? Stanley Lee wasn't involved with the project, and sadly passed away during development, and the game is dedicated to him. The writer of the first Fear Effect returned as a co-writer, but I don't really feel his presence here. You know how things could be with Kickstarter. They say they're bringing a notable writer, and all they end up doing is writing a handful of item descriptions. This title takes place a few years after the events of the first game. They didn't use any of the story elements from the cancelled Inferno. Hana and Rain are an item, living that double income, no kids, lesbian life. Once I find something I like, I stick with it. Another game, another new voice cast. I don't think the voices are bad, save for Deacon Axel. Obviously my resume was perfect for this mission. But the writing and banter does lack some of that bite that the original titles had. It turns out Hana's voice actress used to be a newscaster, and boy is that apparent. We failed to get the item we were looking for in Paris. We followed the track thanks to a company man. Looks like our traffic. I suspect something more. As well, the voice mixing can be all over the place when they're talking. Looks like we're going down. Sure we're going. Glass is somewhere. The Gang of Four return here with the addition of Axel, this French J.C. Denton look-alike with none of J.C.'s charm. There is valuable information we can trade. Let me guess. Art pieces? He's one of those characters that you could just mostly remove from the plot and have no major differences. There's a bit earlier on when the game's at its best with Hana, Deke, and Rain splitting up and doing what they do best. Hana dealing with combat and stealth, Rain with puzzles and hacking, Deke being a waiter overhearing conversations. After that, we're off to Greenland, where we'll spend most of our time in the snow and inside facilities. Instead of pulling from the world of Chinese mythology, Sedna pulls from the world of Inuit mythology. They are a jirat. They're supposed to kidnap children in the tales, but it looks like they were real. That's fine, there's a lot of interesting elements and ideas you could explore there. But with the series so tied to Chinese mythology, it does lose some of that feel of the originals. Besides, there was still plenty of mileage they could get in regards to pulling from Chinese mythology. One element that gets lost in the shuffle with the switch to isometric is the game lacking in the survival horror elements. While we do move away from guards and into the supernatural as the game progresses, it lacks any of that horror feel that would arise in the first or the second. The atmosphere just doesn't land. And as the story goes on, it gets out there like the prior titles, but here it's more difficult to follow because it's fairly unclear what some of the group's motivations are. Glass here is especially hard to follow with what's going on with him. Sure, the other titles could get out there and be a bit hard to follow, but the character motivations were clear and they had that great camaraderie amongst them. Overall, Senna is a disjointed game. There's signs of a team out of their element and working on something they obviously need more resources for and support than they got. And there is something decent here beneath the surface. And the cesspool of reboots and revivals of old IPs that have occurred over the last decade or so, I've seen much worse. Sure, my expectations were low going since the Metacritic is in the low 40s, but it's clear that the team had an understanding and respect for the source material, which sadly has become the exception instead of the norm in media. Wrapping up, let's look at the future of the series, Fear Effect and Reinvented, a remake of the first game. I was watching the trailer that released in late August of 2022 that got me thinking about this series again and led me to making this video. Before discussing that trailer, let's go back to 2017 when Fear Effect Reinvented was first announced. At this time, it was still being developed by Sushi. The success and support of Kickstarter for Sedna was one of the reasons they received the green light for a remake, and it was also going to make use of a fixed camera approach. The game was set for a 2018 release, but that never happened. The project went quiet for a long period of time beyond some social media posts of concept art. At some point in 2019 or 2020, the version Sushi was developed was scrapped. 
Megapixel would take over the project from scratch. They have some remake experience working on titles like the Panzer Dragoon remake and the House of the Dead remake. And in August 2022, the trailer would drop to not overly positive response, myself included. As of writing, there's not a ton of information beyond the trailer and the description for the video on YouTube. The story is expanded into three separate campaigns. It will feature a modern third-person camera, make use of a cover system. The end of the trailer says, coming sooner than you think. How long that is, I don't know. Maybe 2023? It's been said the puzzles from the original will return along with a slew of new others. There will be stealth gameplay, the death cutscenes will also be present. But what was shown? As I've said with reboots, remakes, and resurrections of old IPs, hell with modern gaming in general, or modern media in general, keep your expectations low. But hey, at least we always have the original titles. While there are a number of frustrations present in Fear Effect that didn't pop them in other Resident Evil-like titles, they still stand as some of the more enjoyable, memorable, and unique titles where studios were tripping over themselves to cash in on that Resident Evil success. From its great characters, pulling heavily from Chinese mythology, excellent puzzles, they're well worth checking out if you haven't done so. And sure, it's easy to emulate like I did here, but if you do want the authentic experience, you can buy copies that won't set you back like so many retro games can. Thanks for watching. If you haven't done so already, do all that stuff YouTube algorithm likes. If you'd like to support the channel further, consider becoming a Patreon or becoming a YouTube member. Thanks everyone. Boulder Punch out.